intimidated, I think is when this church extended the call for me to come serve as your pastor. I mean, I, think, I felt like the interview process went pretty well, you know, and I, we really loved coming here and meeting uh, all the people. The food was outstanding. That's probably really what got us in the door. And uh, hearing that the, the, the vote was positive, that really uh, confirmed for us that this was the place that, that God would have us come and serve. But I remember just back in March on that first Sunday, uh, standing up here, looking out at you there, wondering... Just what have I gotten myself into? What are these people really like? What unknown messes have I wandered into blindly here? Will they like me? Will they like the preaching? Will I be able to lead these people? Will I be successful? And what does success look like in ministry anyway? Is that the number of baptisms? Is that a beautiful building? Is that how big your budget is? I wondered all of that and, and more. And I think that those feelings of doubt and insecurity, those are pretty normal feelings whenever you're uh, coming into a new role or moving into a new community. And it helps me understand a little bit of what Timothy might have felt. You see, Timothy... Uh, he came into a situation that was way less secure than the situation that we came into. No congregation extended a call for Timothy to come. Paul appointed Timothy to take the lead in this place. And there's no indication that anybody asked for that or wanted him there. And we read early on in the letter here that there's indications that Timothy didn't necessarily desire to be there either. And moreover, Timothy was relatively young, probably in his mid-30s. He was timid and shy by nature. He wasn't a take-charge kind of leader who set out to assert himself, and that probably made him sort of a natural target for his opponents. You can hear them, can't you? We need somebody with experience here. Who's this kid to come in here and tell us what to do? And it's easy to imagine for me, young Timothy, waking up in the middle of the night, maybe with pain in his sensitive stomach, and quietly murmuring to himself, what am I doing here? How will I lead these people? Will I be successful? And as Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, he knew some of that anxiousness and, and turmoil that was involved with leading a church because he experienced that same thing. And now as we come to the end of the fourth chapter of this letter to Timothy here, Paul turns to address his young apprentice in really intimate and, and caring terms. And as he, he passes on this personal wisdom to Timothy, what we see along the way is that he also reveals what a successful ministry looks like. Look at chapter 4, starting in verse 11. Paul writes, Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. What does success in ministry look like? Did you notice what's not there? Big crowds, not there. Beautiful buildings, nope. No particular music style, not the number of YouTube views. But what is here are six distinct marks of a successful ministry. And they all fit in two categories, sound doctrine and sound living. Sound doctrine and sound living, six marks 
altogether. Here's the first one. First mark is teach with authority. Verse 11, command and teach these things. He's saying, prescribe these things. Insist on these things. Order these things. What things? Well, it could be what he's written so far the entire letter, but at the very least, it's certainly everything he's written so far in chapter 4. Oppose the extreme asceticism of the false teachers. Train yourself for godliness. You see, just as God had commanded Timothy to act, now Timothy was to command the church to act in the same way. And that word, that very first word translated command, is really important because it sets the tone for this entire passage here. Every single verb in these verses in reference to Timothy is what's called an imperative. It's a command here. Just let your eyes wander back through that passage as I, as I tell you these commands. Okay, look at them. Command. Teach. Let no one despise you. Set the believers an example. Devote yourself. Do not neglect the gift you have. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. Keep a close watch. Persist in this. These are not mere suggestions that Paul's making. These are, every one of them, uh, an authoritative command. And that's one mark of successful ministry, is that teaching comes with authority. Teaching comes with authority. Not the authority of the one who's teaching, but authority that is derived from the word of God. You see, teaching with authority is not uh, sharing uh, opinions and observations and, and ponderings. Teaching with authority is not seeking to be entertaining or popular or pleasing. One of the deep needs of the church today is biblical teaching that is powerful, that's convicting, that's transforming. It's teaching with authority. And after all, that is the pattern that we see in Scripture. In Acts 17.30, Paul says that God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Jesus' first words of his public ministry that are recorded for us, an authoritative command. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Paul instructed Titus to rebuke and exhort with all authority. Guys, the way that we approach teaching, even sometimes evangelism and the gospel, is so far off from this. We've gotten this so backwards. The, the call to repent and believe is not an invitation to be considered and then politely accepted or declined. The call to repent and believe is a command. It's always an imperative in scripture. And so it's a command to be obeyed or disobeyed. A successful ministry is marked by teaching that confronts sin, that takes on unbelief and disobedience, and it does it without wavering or faltering. Now, it's tempered, right? It's tempered with gentleness and, and graciousness. It's never abusive or ungracious, but at the same time, every sermon should come with a tone of authority derived from God's word. And so in a successful ministry, uh, the word of God is boldly proclaimed as both the leaders and the congregation submit to its authority and trust the word uh, to do its work. You see, there's no extra ingredients that need to be added to the word of God. It's not my job to try to butter it up or to try to water it down. My job is to present it faithfully and let it speak for itself. Or as it's often been said, the preacher is not the chef who creates the meal. The preacher is the butler whose job it is to get it to the table without screwing it up. That's the first mark of a successful ministry. Authoritative teaching. Okay? Here's the second mark. Develop personal godliness. Verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. You want, to, you want to experience successful ministry? You need godly character. 
Timothy's leadership, it was challenged because of his youth and his inexperience and his shyness. You might be challenged or threatened in your ministry for any number of reasons. And when that happens to you, what's your first response? Is it godliness? Or are you more likely to get defensive, to fight back, to get even? Which might feel really good in the moment to do that, but ultimately that's going to cut the legs out from under your ministry and your Christian witness. Look at what Paul commands here instead. When you are reviled, he says, set an example of godliness for others. And he shares five areas of concern there. See them? And he starts with speech. Your speech is the first area of concern. Now, there's really no way to say this politely, so I'll just say it. Some of us just talk too much. And, and pastors can be guilty of that just as much as anybody else. When we get in trouble, a lot of us, it's often with our mouths, isn't it? And it's not just talking too much, but often it's what comes along with that, listening too little, which allows us to say even more dumb things. There's sarcasm that crosses the line. Speaking out of a desire to be right more than to be loving. Talking behind other people's backs. Masquerading gossip as prayer requests. Lying, boasting, swearing. There are innumerable ways that our speech is sinful. And what makes it worse is Jesus' rebuke that what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And that's what ultimately defiles you. So Timothy, and all of us, must model self-control in our speech here. And along with that, Paul says, be an example in conduct. Now, conduct is just your normal behavior. As you go about your day-to-day -day routines, uh, getting groceries, driving to work, going to the kids' games, whatever the case may be, as you're in your normal course of life, you must be an example especially to those who believe, he says here. And you see, speech and conduct, they go together because those are things that are easily seen and observed by others. How, what you talk like and what you do. That's on display all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. But in addition to those observable traits, Paul charges Timothy also to be godly in three inner qualities, in love, in faith, in purity. So Timothy is to be loving to all people in all circumstances. He is to display his faith through his faithfulness, through his commitment. And he's to be pure. That means sexually, of course, but also in just matters of the heart. He's to live a pure lifestyle. So here's what we get when we put all of that together. Successful ministry is a matter of developing and practicing personal godliness. And that's true for all Christians. But it's especially true, as seen here, for church leaders. They're to set an example. Because character counts. So if you're looking for a successful ministry, Mark 1, authoritative teaching. Mark 2, personal godliness. Brings us to the third mark. Be centered on the word. Be centered on the word. Verse 13. Until I come... Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Any ministry that can legitimately be called successful must be grounded in God's word. God's word must be front and center in a successful ministry. It's one simple sentence here in verse 13, but it sheds so much light on the priorities of teachers and the priorities of worship in the church. Until I come, Paul says. It reminds us that his intention was to deliver these instructions personally, but until then, Timothy was to ensure that the ministry taking place in Ephesus was uh, thoroughly biblical. He says, devote yourself. Don't forget, that's another command, not a suggestion. Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, or literally, devote yourself to the reading, is how it says. Now, that wasn't something new, okay? This is something that the Christian church adopted from the Jewish synagogue. You remember back in Luke 4, Jesus in the synagogue at Nazareth stands up and reads 
from the scroll at Isaiah. This was a common practice. Its roots go back even farther than that. When we look at Nehemiah chapter 8, we see uh, the men and women of Israel standing up from early morning to midday while Ezra read from the book of the law to them. And they explained what it meant. So the church kept that custom of reading from the Old Testament. But here's what's different. They started to add in the reading of the apostles' letters and the gospels. That's huge. These are contemporary writings for the early church that are being placed on the same authoritative level as the Old Testament. That's, that shows us a couple things. Uh, it shows us early on in the church there was a recognition of this remarkable continuity between the Old Testament and what was being written that would become the New Testament. It's a recognition that this was one story God was telling here. And also, just the fact that they read the scripture and then explained it, that established the fact that the authority came from God's word and the preaching flowed out of that authority that was in God's word. So there's the reading. And then next he says, give attention to exhortation. That's what we call preaching. Exhortation or preaching. Preaching is uh, authoritative. Preaching is challenging and it's also not a conversation, which makes it challenging in our culture, where we want interaction. We want our opinions heard. But in preaching, communication primarily comes one way, from God's word, through the preacher, to the listener. But it's not meant, and it never should be, just a stiff lecture about the meaning of a text. Preaching is meant to prick your conscience in some way. That might come in the form of a warning or a rebuke or words of wisdom or gentle comfort. Whatever the case may be, preaching should always move you to some sort of action in response. Devote yourself to the reading, to exhortation, and also to teaching, he says. Now, teaching is just the systematic explanation of God's word. Let's go through this and find out what it means. Now, you can have preaching without teaching, although you shouldn't. What that looks like is just somebody getting up here and telling you what they think. You can have teaching, though, without preaching. Right? Teaching takes place in a variety of settings. That might be in a Sunday school class, a small group, one-on-one -on -one over a cup of coffee. And teaching lends itself to something that's more dynamic, more interactive. So that's good, and there's certainly a place for that. But I want us to think for just a moment here about teaching as a part of preaching. Because it should certainly never be less than that. John Stott, he writes this when it comes to uh, the way a preacher should approach teaching. He says, It was taken for granted from the beginning that Christian preaching would be expository preaching. That is, that all Christian instruction and exhortation would be drawn out of the passage which had been read. That's what expository preaching is. Drawing the meaning out of the text, not reading the meaning into the text. That's a big difference. Okay, Expository preaching is the idea that the sermon uh, submits to the shape and the emphasis of God's word rather than uh, the opposite of that. Wh which you see often where I might find three points in the Bible that back up what I want to say, but they're completely ripped out of context. The idea is to bring out of Scripture what's there and not put into it what's not there. And honestly, guys, this is something I'd never heard until about 10 or 11 years ago in our little church in Las Vegas that we were going to at the time. That's the first time I ever heard expository preaching. And I remember it because I thought, what is this? It, it was... It was Literally, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. It was life-changing for me to hear God's word unpacked in expository preaching. But sadly, what's all more common in churches today is that the scripture might get read, but then hardly alluded to again during the sermon. A lot of what passes for preaching in a lot of pulpits never seriously engages with the biblical text. Yeah, there's jokes and stories. There's political and social soapboxes. 
But you know, you can join Toastmasters or go down to the Rotary Club if that's all you're looking for. What Paul calls Timothy to here is something radically different. A successful ministry is a word-centered ministry. God's word has to be front and center, read regularly, and it must be preached expositionally, or the church will suffer. It will be weakened. It will start to drift from its purpose. Let's move on here to the fourth mark. Mark four of a successful ministry, fulfill your calling. Fulfill your calling. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. And the language there indicates that Timothy just might have been tempted to give up and leave altogether. And so to encourage him, Paul commands Timothy to remember now. Remember, Timothy, this moment in your past when Paul and the other elders prayed over him, prophesied over him concerning his giftedness, and laid hands on him. This was a gift. Timothy received this gift from God, like all believers receive. All believers are endowed with a God-given gift, a, a spiritual capability that is meant to serve others and bring glory to God. For Timothy, his gift included evangelism and teaching and leadership and preaching. So he received the gift from God. Think of how Timothy had this now. He had a great package. He received the gift from God. Then that gift is confirmed by direct revelation from God. That's what prophecy is. And then it's also affirmed by the, by the local elders and Paul himself as they lay hands on him. So what he had here was a consensus from God and his church leaders that he was called and gifted for the ministry. So for him to bail out on this now would be to completely reject that call. Paul's basically saying, Timothy, God has gifted you for this. You are wired for this. You've got a gift. Now you either use it or you lose it. Your, your spiritual gift has to be cultivated. It has to be used. It has to be uh, improved upon. It's not meant to sit stagnant. What good is a gift if you never open the box and get it out to use it? To be successful in ministry means making use of your spiritual gift as God uh, has called you in your life to fulfill your calling using those gifts he's given you. Okay, here's another mark of ministry success. Verse 15, work diligently. Working diligently. Verse 15 says, practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Now, that sounds kind of familiar. It sounds sort of like the athletic language used back in verse 7, where he says, train yourself for godliness. And in the same way, this here is a call to work diligently at your faith. And it's even intensified by that phrase, uh, immerse yourself in them, or literally, be in these things with the idea that you're absorbed by these things. Timothy's to give everything he has to godly living, to the ministry of the word, and to fulfilling his calling. He's to give everything to that. Success in ministry. If we understand that term success properly, will never come apart from hard and diligent work. Now, God gets all the credit for that, right? But at the same time, if you're a Christian, you're called to work. You don't get a day off from being a Christian. A church leader is always on call for whatever might be happening. There may not be an event taking place, but uh, a church leader or even a Christian in the church is going to be involved in praying or planning or preparing for whatever's next. The work of the ministry is consuming. Now that can become unhealthy. Right? Overwork is a sin that needs to be guarded against. And there are some pastors who, who work too much. But frankly, the bigger problem is that the ministry can be a great place for lazy men to hide. You know, my schedule is pretty flexible. I don't have anybody watching over my shoulder to make sure I'm getting done what should be getting done. But if the time and the efforts not being put in, a healthy congregation will eventually notice. 
Because the preaching of a pastor who isn't preoccupied with God's word certainly won't be able to preoccupy your heart and your thoughts with his preaching. Here's, here's the deal. The diligent work of a Christian or a church leader is something that should be evident to all, as Paul says here, so that all may see your progress. Now, it's, it's not that you're flawless. It's not that you've already arrived. No Christian is yet what he or she will be in Christ. The Christian life is one of progress. Remember, it's about direction, not perfection. And even leaders, maybe especially leaders, should allow the congregation to see their progress in spiritual growth and maturity and knowledge. Successful ministry means working diligently to display growth in God's grace and in Christ's likeness. Okay, so let's recap here. Here's what we've seen so far. This is what successful ministry will be marked by. Teaching with authority, developing and practicing personal godliness, being centered on the word, fulfilling your calling, and working diligently. Okay, now all of that brings us to this last mark, which really is more of a summary of those other five marks. The last one here is balance your life and doctrine. Balance your life and doctrine. Verse 16. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Okay, two categories. Sound doctrine and sound living. The other five marks each fit into one of those two categories. Keep a close watch on yourself. Okay, this is the sound living that's the need for personal godliness. That's fulfilling your calling. That's working diligently. Keep a close watch on the teaching. That's the doctrine, right? That refers to the primacy of God's word and that it must be preached and taught with authority. That's the key to ministry success. This balance between living a godly life and guarding right doctrine. Both of those things are critical to success in ministry because godly living has everything to do with right doctrine. Because what you, uh, well, if you don't live according to what you know about God and his word, you will either end up twisting his word to suit what you believe or just disbelieving it altogether. But at the same time, guarding right doctrine has everything to do with godly living. Because what you believe about God impacts the way you live. And the more you know about him, the more you love him. And the more you want to please him. And the opposite of that is also true. You have to keep a close watch, Paul says, on both your life and your doctrine. Hmm. How about you? Are those things consistent? How's your speech? How's your conduct? How's your love, your faith, your purity? How's your doctrine? Is it centered on God's word? Or have you allowed culture and politics to creep in and dilute it? Do you really believe what you say you believe? If we asked your family, would they agree? This is so important for successful ministry. And ministry, I'm using this in the term of what we are all called to. Because, he says here, if you persist in this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Okay, now of course, salvation only comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You cannot save yourself or anyone else, right? So don't misunderstand what Paul's saying here. His point is that those who persist in life and doctrine. Those who persevere in life and doctrine will be the ones who persist and persevere in salvation. These are the ones who work out their own salvation even as God works in them. Timothy was in a tough spot. Here he is in a church where nobody asked for him to come. 
He's, he's in a church where people are looking down on him because of his inexperience, because of his personality. So how did he find success in ministry? By looking to the most successful minister who ever lived. Not Paul. When Jesus taught, we read that the people were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. The perfect example of personal godliness that Jesus set for all who follow him in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity is unequaled. Jesus was centered on God's word. He read from it at the synagogue. He quoted from it to resist temptation. He used it to exhort and teach and correct and rebuke. Jesus never faltered in right doctrine or godly living. Jesus worked diligently as he went about the Father's business, rising early, traveling long distances, pushing himself to the point of physical exhaustion. Jesus utilized his giftedness. Think of the teaching and the healings and the miracles. And Jesus fulfilled his calling, never turning back on it, even when faced with suffering and hardships and trials. At the peak of his popularity, when he was most successful, with the shouts of Hosanna still ringing through the streets of Jerusalem, here's what Jesus said. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. You see, for Jesus, success lay in the shadow of Calvary's cross. What does success in ministry look like? It looks like a child born in poverty and raised in obscurity. It looks like a homeless leader of a ragtag bunch of country bumpkins. It looks like a man who was moved to tears at the thought of people perishing. It looks like a man who in his agony sweats drops of blood. It looks like a man hanging bruised, battered, and bleeding from a Roman cross, faithful to the end. But because of his faithfulness, success in ministry also looks like an empty tomb. It also looks like a risen savior. It also looks like a glorified Messiah who will bring about a kingdom that knows no end. Success in ministry is not the ability to attract huge crowds or sell lots of books or meet felt needs. If you want to succeed in ministry, believer, the only way to do that is to be faithful to the faithful one. In one word, success in ministry is faithfulness. Are you more faithful to Jesus now than you were at this time last year? How about a month ago? How about before you walked in here this morning? This is what you always need to be asking yourself. Not because of it being about you, but because when we display the goodness of Christ and the character of Christ and the word of Christ in the church, people will be drawn to him. That's why we're centered on the word and committed to its authority so that people will be saved through it. That's why we pursue godly living and work diligently so people will see the difference that Jesus makes. That's why we fulfill our calling and balance life in doctrine so that people see in us the majesty of Christ. It's all about him. Along the way, there will be times when you feel inadequate. Guess what? You are by yourself. But in Christ, who loves you, you are more than a conqueror. Success in ministry and success in life and success in faith is found only in and through Jesus Christ. So, 
Your job then is to pursue after him and everything that he has to offer you with reckless abandon. That's success in Jesus. We would like to thank you for joining us for the Victory Podcast today. This podcast is a ministry of Victory Baptist Church in Hermiston, Oregon. You can find us at 193 East Main Street in Hermiston, Oregon, 97838, or on the web at yourvictory.org.